Good morning, everyone. I'm Molly Strabat, Director of the Duke Office of Postdoctoral Services. And I'd like to welcome you to our first panel discussion in our series on the academic job search. This series is co-sponsored with the Duke uh, Graduate Career Center and the Duke Graduate School. And upcoming events in the academic job search series include the what, academic interview, negotiating the job offer, creating the teaching statement, and the tech-savvy job search. You can find all of those entries on the postdoc website, postdoc.duke.edu. Today's discussion is on the initial search process, so that is CVs, cover letters, research and teaching statements. Many of you sub uh, submitted your questions online in advance. Thank you for doing that. We will start with those questions and then open the floor to questions for you from, from the audience. And I would like to thank our panelists very much for taking time from their busy schedule to join us today. We really appreciate you sharing your time and advice. Oh, yeah. Thank you. And our panelists today are Patrick Charbonneau, who was just recently promoted to Associate Professor of Chemistry. Woo! And Dennis Coe, MD, PhD, Assistant Professor of Molecular Genetics and Microbiology and Medicine. John Willis, Professor of Biology. Thank you very much for coming all the way over here, John. And Jennifer West, who is Professor of Biomedical Engineering, is running a little late today, but she will be joining us shortly. So I'm going to first uh, ask the panelists to introduce themselves and briefly talk about how they have been involved in the faculty search process. And then we'll start with questions. So Patrick, would you like to start? Uh, yes, hi. Uh, my name is Patrick Charbonneau. I'm originally from Montreal, which is why I have a French last name. Someone else from <laughs> Montreal? <laughs> um, uh, I've been at Duke for seven years now, and I've been involved in, in the job search process as, as looking for a job myself when I was in the job market, and more recently over the last few years sitting on, as, you know, in faculty meetings as the rest of my colleagues were trying to recruit uh, other junior candidates. And I say I was sitting by the sideline in a sense because they were as a junior faculty, so sometimes you spend a lot of time watching and listening what others are doing, and also because the people we were recruiting were not directly in my field of work, so I felt that, it, at least in the early searches, I didn't say much, but I spent a lot of time looking, listening, observing as to how it works, how my colleagues think, how they react, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have in this respect. Okay, so I'm Dennis Coe. I've been uh, here at Duke for three years now. I uh, study genetics of infectious disease, um, and so because I've only been here for three years, I went through uh, my own search right before that um, for two years. I searched for two years, and then more recently, um, we just hired a new faculty member in, in my department, like the genetics and microbiology. <coughs> he just started uh, a couple weeks ago, so I was, I was part of that search. So I'm John Willis. I'm in the Department of Biology. I'm an evolutionary biologist. Uh, work on plants, population genetics, ecology, evolution. Um, I've been at Duke since 2000, so for 15 years. And before that, I was uh, assistant professor and an associate professor at the University of Oregon for about seven years before moving here. So I've been involved in a lot of searches. Um, you know, both within my area of expertise as well as serving um, on searches within my department in areas outside of my own expertise as well as, you know, an uh, outside member in other departments. Um, so, and I've also had a lot of postdocs in my lab who have gone on, most of them, to uh, get jobs that they were happy with and so have helped guide them through the application process over the last 20 some odd years, I guess. Um, so, you know, I could share my experiences at all those different levels. That would be great. Can you tell us a little bit about how search committees are set up? So they're usually set up, at least the ones that I'm familiar with, um, the chair appoints a search committee in consultation, I believe, with the deans. Um, but certainly the chair is the main person. And they generally pick uh, the, the, the lead of the search, the chair of the search, would be someone in the area in which you're searching. And then there'd be one or two or three people who are, had expertise in that general area. But then they try to make sure that the search um, committee has a broad representation from within the department as well as across the university. 
particularly if it's an interdisciplinary search, which is very common here at Duke. So um, always, so for example, if there's a search in molecular genetics within the Department of Biology, there'll be two or three people, including the chair of the search, who will be in that field and will go to all of the relevant meetings and know all of the various main you know, famous PIs and so forth. But then there'll also be one or two people from very different fields within biology, an ecologist, for example. And then there might be a computational biologist from outside the department, something like that. So we, especially in biology, which is an arts and sciences department, and we teach all undergrad courses um, for biology majors and so forth, we really want to make sure that the search committee is quite broad in their expertise. So, um, but it's appointed by the chair, and basically the chair goes around and asks people to serve on it. Thank you. If I could, if I could comment on this, the, you need, one thing you need to make, uh, to keep in mind throughout this discussion is that there's how things happen in general, and how broad the variance there can be from one case to the other, right? So these are the general guidelines, and this is how things happen on average, but the variance is very broad. And there's a lot of politics that goes on into the construction of those search committees. Right? For instance, I'll take an example that, I, that I'm making up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say you have a senior faculty who's been promised a, a search in his or her area uh, in your department, and this senior faculty happens to be a very forceful voice. Right. Then as you assemble the, the committee, maybe you'll try to get other forceful voices that can counterbalance this view so that you make sure that the search is done in a productive way. Or not. Or, or not. <laughs> right? or, or maybe that the search fails. Right? If you're really Machiavellic as a chair, I mean, it's true that it's the chair that decides to appoint and you do this in consultation with the dean, but the motivation that goes into that construction can be very broad. I mean, the Duke has recently put in a and policy actually over the summer as to how uh, search committees has, have to be structured from now on, and that must include someone from outside the department in which the search is conducted. It used to be something that some departments did, but it was not mandatory. And the re one of the reasons, I mean, there's many reasons to do this. One first of them is to allow searches to be more interdisciplinary. It's also to make sure that if there are weaker units within a department, within a, within a university, these can be maybe drifted along in the direction uh, that, of, of strength, help them recognize stronger candidates, recognize stronger directions. So on average, and in general, this is how it happens, but there can, there's very subtle uh, points that appear in the construction of a, of a search committee. And these are, because these are maybe the most essential decisions that a department ever takes, right? Choosing job junior people to join your department and therefore try to increase the quality or perpetuate the quality of the department, this is done very seriously and everything is weighed in, in, in their construction. So how about the construction of the actual job ad? Sometimes you see ones that are extremely specific and other times they're so broad it could fit anyone. So what's the politics behind that? Uh, well, so, so for the, this most recent search we just did, it was essentially the, the, you know, the, the chair of our department had talked to various people in the department about what we wanted to look for in this particular, this is a very open search um, in terms of topic, um, and basically we wrote the ad, sent it out to the department, this is what they can send in, and then you know, we could give them some feedback on that, the search um, yeah. yeah, so I mean often it is uh, somewhat political, but there's often this tension between people who are looking for a very specific type of researcher or teacher for the position um, versus the broader interests of the department or the university wanting to basically cast a wide net and try to get the best person possible without paying too much attention to the particular subfield that they are experts in. So this is always the tension, right? You know, you'll see a very broad ad and you might think, oh wow, there are going to be a zillion people that are looking very broadly, but then again, the chair might be the super powerful person who didn't win the battle about writing the ad, so it's a very broad ad, but that powerful person has very specific, you know, uh, phenotype that they want to target. So, uh, 
<laughs> you know, I really would ignore the, the wording of the ad, I think, and just apply to absolutely everything. <laughs> you know, there's no reason to limit yourself. I mean, what's the harm in applying to a job that you think might be targeted to someone else? I mean, so what? You apply and you don't get the interview, but you might get lucky. And so I would just apply everywhere. So it used to be that applying for faculty position meant like a FedEx envelope, but yeah. that the cost of applying has gone to essentially zero. Yeah. So it's applying for grad school is more expensive than applying for faculty position. <laughs> so, yeah, if it's narrowly worded, maybe the, the chair of the committee won that battle, but won't win the overall search battle. And so, you know, someone who's not quite in the narrow field that the job is written, you know, would have a better chance ultimately. Is there any way you can contact the chair of the department or someone on the search committee, or is that a no-no? No, that's a no-no. You know, I mean, if you have a buddy there, you could always ask. But by reading the tea leaves, it's just going to give you ulcers. And why bother? You know, there's, there's, yeah. I mean, as, as you know, as our sales member of the department, we try to understand what the politics is. As someone from the outside, it's really a waste of time and a waste of energy. Yeah. Unless you have easy, accessible information. Otherwise, you just may may sound aloof, and, exactly. and the information you're going to get may not even be accurate, and you're going to waste your time. So, just a quick follow up on the same thought. So, if he, if it's so cheap to just apply it to everything, isn't that also part of the problem? There's just so much noise where where the signal is just kind of this little dot in there. So, how how does a committee go about just filtering through all these things, you know, in a manner that somebody who is not specifically targeted in the ad can really have a chance? Well, it depends on the composition of the committee, right? If there is a strong leader with a strong direction and you apply in a, a, to an ad that's targeted, you may not come through, right? Then maybe you have no chance of coming through. But that's, that's okay. You know, the, the, it's just that the flip side is that if you don't apply, you're guaranteed never to go above the noise. But there's, maybe there's no way you could go above the noise if there's such a, a strong intent behind it. Behind it anyway, so it's not. Yeah, I think it was. It. No, so, so for this most recent search, it was um, basically we had you know over 100 applicants, and it was just the, the two chairs who actually read all the applications. Everyone else on the committee had the opportunity. We could have read through them all, but for the most part, I just you know read through part of the um, their the brief description, you know, and. You know, it's up to mainly those chairs to recognize which were the top ten candidates that they each thought, which the rest of the committee completely read. Um, so you don't know who those chairs are for the search, right? All you know is that I'm vaguely related to this area in some way, and you just try to write it as compelling as you can because you don't know who's on the other side, right? So, um, and I think you don't try to like fake it by trying to figure out, okay, this. Is probably someone like this. You just put the most compelling spin to your research, and hope that the people on the other side can see it. And right, that's why you apply to. You know, I apply to like 60 different jobs. Um, so it's, you know, the more you apply to, the more likely someone on the other side will actually get what you're doing. Yeah, and I think it's probably not worthwhile individually crafting your statement or your cover letter or whatever to each and every job you're going to write. Just to write for yourself, you know, about the way you feel about your research, spin it the best way you can in a general way, and then just blanket the whole job market that you're <laughs> <laughs> and, and we really, like, we're talking a lot about the politics and about the, well, I guess the bottom line is just realize that uh, by politics, we're really talking about individual people in a department who are looking for colleagues to help with the research, to increase the profile of the department, whatever. You can't judge all of that. You have no way of knowing what's going on. And really, you can't take it personally if you don't get an interview or whatever. You just have to just send out a ton of applications. And don't worry so much about how the mechanics of each individual search are going to play out. You, you, that's beyond your control. And you're, again, you don't want to give yourself ulcers. 
So what would you say, given that you get 100 applications for the search? What's 200. 200, 200 or 300. Is there one part that sticks out more to you? The CV, the pedigree, the publications, the references? Do you read the cover letter? Do you read the teaching statement? <laughs> I was the first screening take, so I've not sat on the committee uh, for for this, but I can tell you in general, right, as when you receive a package of 200 applicants, whether they're grad students applying or postdocs applying, you need to narrow it down quickly from somewhere 200 to 20 to 30, right, so, and the, the first screen is not going to be, uh, I think when Duke undergrads, uh, or when undergrads apply to Duke, uh, there's this statement that they're guaranteed that at least two people will read their entire file. I can guarantee you that search committees do not guarantee you that your file is going to be <laughs> in its entirety by anyone, even if you get the job. <laughs> <coughs> so so they, they try, you, I mean, you become adept at uh, recognizing patterns and at looking for the broad strokes, either through a quick look through a CV, uh, the, the, the letters of references, the few keywords that appear, uh, and then you, you go from 200 to 30. And then the, the 30, then typically that's what you will spread to your colleagues on the rest of the committee. Said, well, let's, let's go through those more carefully and let's identify what's important. But you, know, you need to give a, a good, broad impression to make the cut from 200 to 30. Yeah. And you did it, so how, how did you do it? You, you said you looked at the I, I, the statements quickly. Oh, yeah, so I mean, it, it's all online in our department, so there was, you know, 130 or so applicants with their own brief description of what the research was, which was like a sentence. Um, and, you know, the only ones that I looked at carefully were when that brief sentence that anyone, that the applicant entered in, when that was compelling, I went and read the rest of it, essentially. Right, since um, the, basically the two chairs said they were going to read all the applications and give us the top 10 each, which we would then discuss. Um, and in terms of what parts of the application they looked at most carefully, I'm, I'm not sure. I know for, for myself, I, I actually do, for those ones that were the finalists, I did read all, all the cover letters. I read the, their entire applications, essentially. Um, and I, I actually liked it when the cover letter was more geared toward the particular position. So. From my own experience, I applied to some which were completely specific. We want people studying functional consequences of human genetic variation. So that cover letter was, it was quite a bit different than we we're looking uh, where uh, undergrad teaching campus, looking for <coughs> people to teach and do research in cell biology. And I got job offers from both of those things. My cover letters were quite different, right? Because they're at teaching at, at, at uh, a state university, um, it's quite different than you know being here uh, doing research in the medical school, um, and it, for me, it, you know, it mattered what they said in, in the cover letter because it you can give the sense that you actually want to be at this place through a well-written cover letter, um, but obviously it's not you know the only thing that that we looked at, and we looked at CV and research statement and all that as well. So I guess oh, just sorry one follow-up thing. So I guess this will you know, help you to get a sense of the variance in <laughs> committees and stuff. I've probably read five or six cover letters in my life, even though I've read, uh, you know, um, thousands upon thousands of applicants, applications for faculty positions, right? So I don't care about, I mean, to me, you know, a cover letter that says, in close, please find, the, you know, my application materials, for such and such a job, <laughs> that that's fine with me because the the research statement the the um, thing should stand out. Now you make a really good point about uh, a medical center type appointment that does not have a large teaching component versus you said a state school that's teaching, but actually it could be the biology arts department and, and arts and sciences. So that is a <coughs> distinction, right? You know, a pure research uh, type position where part of your salary is going to be defrayed from your grants and all of this, I mean, I imagine that's what the kind of situation you've got, um, as opposed to uh, a, a faculty position where you're going to be teaching undergrads, like an arts and sciences department. Um, those are fundamentally different types of jobs. Just like, you know, you might apply to industry 
and you would use a very, you know, pharmaceuticals or whatever, you would take a very, have a very different statement for that job than you would for a small liberal arts college. So, but if you're applying to a bunch of research teaching positions like in arts and sciences, I wouldn't really tweak it much beyond, you know. I mean, uh, if I could add this, the, the cover letter can also be then typically be used to, to reconcile cognitive disconnects. Let's say you got your PhD in physics, you're applying for jobs in a medical school or in an engineering school. And people are like, why? You know, why is this? Or there's a big gap of five years where you work for a bank in New York. You know, and you went back to academia. So you need to explain this. If you're part of the, the, the standard model, I did an undergrad and a good PhD, and I go to postdoc, and I'm applying in the same department I've always worked in, and I have not changed fields. Yeah. You, I mean, you may not stand out in your research, maybe, or maybe you are, depending on what you, but people sort of anticipate that profile. And it's when the profile is a bit different that people like to see, well, why does not, not, and you look like a great candidate, looks like what you published is really awesome, but there's just things weird. And if you think that your file is something that someone could construe it as weird, it's great to spin it in the best possible way in the cover letter. Yeah, I guess the other exception to that is um, sometimes you'll, this is not necessarily for you guys at this stage, but suppose you get a job and then a couple years later your dream job opens <coughs> up or you know, you're coming up for tenure and you really don't want to be stuck in this place and you want to go someplace else. Um, you know, there you would say, I'm really not blanketing the job market. This is a, I really want to be at this place, and this is why I'm applying. It's not that I'm about to be denied tenure. I'm doing just great, you know. So if uh, there are extenuating circumstances, definitely include that in the cover letter. But. What does your publication record need to look like before you start applying? Do you, like, how many publications per year, what kind of, do you have to have a nature or a science or a cell to even get looked at nowadays? Or? Before we do that, I think there were a couple of questions that were just following oh, up. Yeah, that. I just wanted to get through the ones that we okay. people submitted in advance, mm -hmm. since those are, and then we'll sure. open it up. You need to be competitive with respect to the peers in your field, whatever that means. If the, you know, the 100 other postdoc candidates your year have science and nature papers, you need cell science of nature to stand up. Right? Uh, if you're working in a field where this is not the type of publication that's characteristic of a, a strong impact or strong accomplishment, then you don't need it. Right? But you may need something else. So it's extremely field dependent, extremely dependent on who else in the, is on the market and what has become the norm in your field. And you, you sort of know what that is, right? You know, you go to conferences, you, you meet your peers, you can look up their CVs online, can see what they've done, and then you have an idea of where you stand in that in, in that ranking, right? And that's essentially what you should be thinking is is the norm. And again, if you have something that's very different from this, but you think that you should you re-stand out for other reasons, that that's something you could bring up in a cover letter. If you can explain why <clears throat> well, your work is not in, in, in I don't know in cell because uh, for for ethical reasons or for uh, Political reasons, or you know, you may try to to explain this. Uh, or, okay. um, yeah. So I applied with a single first author publication as a postdoc. Um, it was in a journal like probably half of you have not heard of. Um, <laughs> Only half. Uh, maybe more. It was sort of American Journal of Human Genetics. Like three of you. <laughs> <laughs> right. So. And uh, maybe that's why I, I felt like crafting the cover letter and the uh, research statement were really important for me because I didn't have that big, this is like, oh, he's published in Science and Nature, it's obviously hugely important, right? What I had was sort of a unique take on studying human genetic variation that I don't think anyone else was doing, right? So it was important for me to get that across in, in what I was writing because the publication record was one paper. Right, um, and I think it's important what you're saying. You're being judged against your peers. So, right for the job search here, which was for functional consequences of human genetic variation, there's probably 
five postdocs working on that specific thing at the time, right, in the country. So that bar was a little bit lower in terms of publication because they weren't getting enough people doing what they were looking for. On the other hand, these more broad searches, you know, cell biology, um, I knew I would have a hard time distinguishing myself from people who are com coming from hardcore cell biology labs who had multiple cell publications. So if you can find those really specific, you know, again, like John was saying, you have to take what's in the ad, the grain of salt, but if you can find those ones that are really um, asking for what you are doing, you know, there, there are like a couple that felt like these ads are written for me, I'm going to be really disappointed if I don't get, get one of these jobs, right? Um, I spent more time on those because I knew there was sort of a, a better shot and a smaller pool. Yeah, I guess um, the other thing is that oftentimes people will be first author on a high profile paper, but they, you know, it's not a project that they spent you know, years developing. It, it might be something where they stepped in as a postdoc and quickly were able to make a couple of contributions on a story that was already well established and so forth, but they got a high profile paper. On the other hand, there might be someone who really started from ground zero or from scratch and built up this project that has a huge amount of potential, but it hasn't quite got to the high profile paper yet. And they might have a couple of very solid foundational papers in, you know, great journals in the field, but not necessarily across all of sciences like science nature itself. So, uh, you know, if I was on a search committee, I'd be much more excited about hiring that person who was really on a trajectory and was taking that project with them and would start their lab. Um, you know, I, I would say that, at least the way I look at applications, I'm looking at the future. You know, whatever has been published is the past. And you're hiring that person to develop, you know, to set up their own lab, to start attracting students, to start, you know, having a forward trajectory. Whenever you hire someone, whenever someone comes up for tenure or promotion, you're always looking for what's going in the future. Is that trajectory going to go up? Is it going to stay flat? Is there, what, what's the likelihood that this person is creative, you know, has the intelligence and nimbleness to go where the, the science drives them, or are they going to plot along sort of doing, uh, you know, clean up, mop up work. And so, you know, that, I think that um, to me that's where, you know, you would, may, maybe the science and nature paper and cell paper would get you in that top 20 or 30 or 40, but um, really when it gets down to, I think most search committees are looking for the future potential, I guess. And so therefore, you know, a few foundational papers that are setting the stage for this great future career, I think would have more weight than something where you just breezed in and got a high profile paper. And how about grant funding? How important is it to have? Can I, can I just comment on this? Oh yeah, because sorry. Because there, there's a, a very interesting presupposition in, in John's statement, which is to the honor of Duke, is that this is in the, in the model of a well-functioning search committee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I have a slight, small vignette, <clears throat> you know, when I was in job market, there was a, one school in Montreal, where I'm from, as I said, where that had a, a job posted, and uh, exactly in my field, and I thought, you know, it's not a great school, but at least I'd be with my family, etc. so I applied for it, and this is, this is actually the first rejection letter I got, <laughs> like within two weeks, and I was really bummed out, I'd not, you know, just in the middle of it, then I, and I went to see my postdoc advisor and at the time, and I said, you know, I don't think it's going to be looking too well. I'd probably be looking to leaving science because, you know, I was like, you know, and he took a pause. There's a reason why they're not that good. So... <laughs> Misunderstood genius. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so in, in the schools where you want to be, in the school, they will recognize your potential, they will be looking for the future, they will look beyond, they will look at the trajectory and where it's leading you. It's no guarantee that this is going to work because there's plenty of poorly functioning search Yeah, that's good. Do you want to? Oh, yes. Dr. Jennifer West is joining us. Thank you. Thanks very much for coming.
And our next question was about grant funding. Do you have to have a history of grant funding? Should you say, I plan to apply for grants? Or is that assumed because they'll hopefully get a startup? Yeah, so like I mentioned in the intro, I applied to two years. The first year, I didn't have any grant funding with me. The second year, I managed to get this K-22 award. And that year, I actually got interviews, whereas the previous year, I had done. Um, publication record was the same, research statement is essentially the same. Um, and uh, looking at it from the other side now, being on the search committee, everyone gets introduced as this is so and so, they have got a perfect score on their K 22 application. It's like the second thing after their name. Um, so, especially in this kind of funding climate where it's, where it's difficult, right, it, I think it gains even greater importance. Uh, I guess uh, a lot of the searches that we have in biology have this kind of quirky aspect to the interview process, and I, I know that this isn't part of the interview process, but uh, in this meeting here today. But um, often we'll have a main job seminar, which will be what the person has done, and then there'll be a chalk talk um, on the second day where they just no powerpoints are allowed, everything is just ideas about where they want to go and what the grants are going to be um, you know, when, they, when they get there. And so I think that this kind of reflects the idea that I was saying earlier in a well-functioning search, you really want to be looking forward. So you know, your research statement should not be totally about what you've done, but rather, okay, now I'm going to do this. And this would be, you would always want to see, like, what would be the first grant that this person would apply for? Is it something that is a good, solid, safe bet for the first grant? And then you want to see, oh, there might be some more risky but higher payoff things down the line, right? So you do want to see this trajectory. I don't, I mean, it would be nice if you have grants already, but it's also, to see that you've got an idea of what your research program is going to be going forward. Again, you want this kind of forward-looking thing, not just your accomplishments, but where are you going to go from here? And that really feeds into, you, you definitely want people to be applying for grants and being successful, and part of that is like, you know, in your head, you know where you want to go, and nothing's going to stop you, and you've got a well-formulated idea for where you want to go. We usually see in the research statement that people will kind of indicate where they anticipate submitting different aspects that they're talking about um, for their grants. And especially in engineering, there are lots of different agencies that people potentially go to. It's not all NIH, so you know, making sure that the applicants understand what types of projects are appropriate for different types of funding sources is something that search committees are sometimes looking for. Um, so making sure that you understand, you know, what's a DOE project versus an NSF project, for example, is potentially important. Um, and then, you know, in BME last year, you know, we interviewed people with K99s and we interviewed people without K99s. It definitely, and we had people who had K99s who we chose not to interview. So it certainly never hurts to already have grant funding, but it's no guarantee that you're going to rise to the top. <coughs> I've got one more from the list and then we'll open it up for questions. So how important are letters of recommendation? Do you read those at the same time that you read the research statement? If, how many should you send? If, if it asks for three, can you send five if they're really good ones or is that crossing the line? I say follow the instructions, personally. I say, you know, when they, they give you a number and you do something else, it seems like you don't know how to read. <laughs> um, and most of the faculty applications are now online systems where you just can't do anything but what the system allows anyway. So if you were to ask five people to submit and only the first three get in, you might not get your best three. So. Um, I suggest following the instructions. I think that letters are critically important. I agree. I mean, I, I generally would skim the research statements, see what the person, you know, what the area is, what their 
sort of future prospects look like. I'd maybe glance at the CV, but then I would look at the letters and see, okay, what do the letter writers say about the future trajectory of this person? Um, so I would read them basically at the same time and give them, you know, take them together as a package. And only later look at, like, do bean counting of like how many publications or whatever. And that, to me, would be mainly a way for building the case to convince my colleagues to go for this person or something like that. You know, so the, you know, I would mainly be looking at the research statement of the letters. Yeah, so when, usually when the, the findings of the committee are reported back to the faculty, often there's a document generated. This document has your name and a few other information. And very often they will include citations from the letters. Say, so and so said this and that about this candidate. So it is that important. Yeah. You know, it's part of the third of a page that the full, co full you know, faculty will read about you. That being said, uh, getting good letters is, is important, but getting the right letters is also important. And, and as for the number, it's true that there are systems that don't allow more than a fixed number, but Let's say you did a, a, a PhD and you did a, two postdocs, and one of the postdocs you had a very extensive collaboration with another group, which you were like the key person that, that articulated with this. And it means that really your work has been closely monitored and evaluated by four senior person who are maybe all very important <clears throat> in, in their field and in, in, in your career. It could even, you know, the, the committee may want to read the four letters. Yeah. If that's, you know, there may be a one, one size fits all and they ask for three and, but if you, if you think that there's really four letters because if they don't get that, the four people to talk, it may look like you're trying to shut someone up, yeah. then you could ask, you know, so I have, I'm in this situation. Maybe the, 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 the department will say, no, we won't take in more than three and that's it and that's the end of the story. But, you know, you shouldn't add, you shouldn't have five because, you know, you have a, a, a postdoc you collaborate who's now junior faculty somewhere and you'd like, you know, is your good buddy and you'd like uh, him or her to write a letter. That, that's not a good reason, right? But if there are really, if the committee looks at your file, say like, oh gosh, I'd really like to hear what those four people say, and you think that your file would have this sort of look, then ask. Almost guaranteed the search committee would shoot an email to that fourth person anyway to say, you know, why didn't you write a letter? Even though I know that, you know, usually, typically, I agree with you to just stick with the three, but if there's a compelling reason for a fourth, let's say you're a junior faculty at some place, and you wanted someone to explain why you were applying elsewhere from your current department, that would be an ideal thing for a fourth letter. You would have three that would speak to your research, and a fourth that would be a colleague saying, you know, this department's going to hell in a handbasket, and everyone's in the ship. Hire this person, it's a great opportunity. I would usually not have that letter submitted at in like with the reference letters there. I would sure. usually have that go to the chair of the search sure. committee as like yeah, a different that's true kind too. of letter. Yeah. <laughs> okay, questions? I have two questions. One is if you can do like a list of all documents that usually are included in an application, like cover letters, uh, and uh, mm, more or less, for example, uh, which kind of information we should include in every single document. And on the other hand, I wonder, like single question, uh, I wonder how important is, uh, because I have listened that, for example, uh, postdocs longer than seven or eight years are very difficult to fit in any position because uh, they are like scared about long period postdoc. It's like not very successful or something like this. But yeah, I wonder if it's true or not. I think it depends on what you accomplished in those seven or eight years. If, if those seven and eight years were continuously very um, productive and lots of things happening, and it was clear you were there because you know there were some family constraints that kept you in a location or something like that, but clearly you were making really good progress and doing really well, it's going to be fine. If you were there because you were languishing and struggling, it may be more than an issue. Um, if everyone in your field does six, five years of postdocs and you did six, it's not an issue. right? If everyone in your field goes straight from PhD to faculty position 
and you have seven year postdoc, you, you need to explain this. Right? And again, the place where the cover letter is your atypical compared to your peers, compared to what people do typically in your field, and there may be good compelling reasons for this, and you need to, to explain them to the search committee, because otherwise if you just look at the CV like that, yeah. it, it could mean something bad or it could mean something good, I can't tell. Yeah, so this, I think um, <clears throat> that's a really good point that actually hits on your first question as well. So I think my own personal feeling is that your application should be a personal narrative of yourself and where it should be about your research, where you're going, but also it should, um, you should express your passion uh, about the field that you're in and, you know, it sort of, it shouldn't be all dried and just the facts, you know. So uh, you might want to, so I think a lot of people might put the more personal stuff in a cover letter, but then keep the research statement very um, dry. I don't think that's a good strategy, especially since I never read cover letters. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think if you can convey some passion and stuff in your, um, in your research statement, especially about where you want to go, um, that's really good. And th that's also where in the research statement you could explain, in addition to the cover letter, about why you've been seven years in a postdoc and what that, how that fits into your personal narrative. You really want to craft a story. And how that has you uniquely prepared. Prepared, exactly. To tackle the next stage. You've been mentoring grad students, undergrads. You've been running seminars. You've been getting funding for yourself. You know. So you're better prepared than any of the other people out there because of these extra years. Yeah, and that would not come across if you had just the facts, ma'am, kind of uh, research statement. right? So you really want to say, like who you are, where you're going, and not just what you've done. In a scientific language. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> so related to that, um, how much do committees, suppose you get to the point where someone's actually reading your whole application, um, do people care about like publication timing trajectory then? Like say you're in a seven year postdoc and for the first three years of it, you didn't have output, but then you've been on this like, recent publication, there's a trajectory there of recent publications coming out. Do people pay attention to that and be like, you know, this person is, is hitting a productive stride, that kind of thing? Yeah, definitely. Uh, especially if, if, it, if it's clear that what you're doing is building some sort of system or some sort of model that you are now getting all the papers for, right? I mean, that's sort of the optimal Absolutely. solution. Absolutely, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, yeah. That now you could just turn the crank, and <laughs> the tenure process will be easy because you've got like 30 publications that are going to just come out automatically. You just press the button, and they're coming out. <laughs> 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 <So, laughs> um, yeah. If I can follow up with. Oh, sorry, and oh, just a so you should really make that clear in your research statement. That's again where you don't have it be personal and say, I really set up the system, it's really bearing fruit. And yeah. And I'm leaving with it in my PI. Yeah, the PI <laughs> says take it. You're so great that you're going to be forming this field on your own and you're like <laughs> off to the moon. So, yeah. Um. I was going to ask also, like, say your postdoc is something not totally related to what you did in grad school, hypothetically. <laughs> um, your friend. <laughs> and, um, you know, like, your ultimate goal is to try to bring them together. Like, is it really the, the lines of work? If you wanted to integrate them, is it already is it key to like already have like shown proof of that kind of integration before you hit the job market? If Not you have like necessarily, I think you have to be able to craft a really logical argument about how it's all going to come together, um, and have it be clear that it's going to be feasible and that it's going to make sense, and, and some unique, interesting things are likely to come from it. Um, but you wouldn't necessarily need to have already put them together. Okay. I mean, actually, you know, like, 
um, NRSA postdoc type things, for example, they encourage people to do a postdoc in a field that's different from where they got their PhD. And part of that is to get you well prepared to do this kind of integration that you're talking about. Again, though, this is where the research statement should not be a laundry list of like, in this paper I showed this, in this paper I showed that. You want that, but it should be part of this larger story about who you are, what you've done, where you're going. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Along related lines, um, so I've heard that you know, you're obviously trying to establish yourself as an independent scientist, um, separate from your PhD advisor and postdoc advisor. How, when you're proposing research in your research statements, how close can that be to your what you're currently doing as a postdoc? How different does that need to be in like the short term, medium term? I usually suggest having one thing that's a fairly safe project that's reasonably close to what you've done, that clearly you have the expertise to do, you have some preliminary data you're, you're going to be successful at, and then having one thing that's more of a stretch that shows that you're creative and have your own ideas and will be able to kind of diverge off into new directions. <coughs> I mean, you have to remember that the, so the committee is looking at it as if five or six or seven years down the road, they'll be able to send your phone around the country and people will be able to see the difference between you and your former advisors. Yeah. Right? If you're epsilon away and you're diverging right, because you're taking a completely different path and you know, they can't imagine, they, they, they forget that you even had an advisor, then it's a good scenario. If they say like, oh, that person's a junior faculty, I thought they were still working together. Then, then you failed. So that's, it needs to be something that you will be able to call your own and that you'll have impact associated with, with your own contributions and not just an offshoot. And at the same time, they have to believe that you can succeed yeah. in your first year. So they're balancing these two things. And this is also where the letters come into play because presumably you will have talked to your postdoc advisor about what you can and cannot take from the lab that you're in um, and you know where you want to go and so that will help shape your, your trajectory. Um, again, you know, I think here at Duke, for example, I think we tend to look for people who are creative, individual thinkers, uh, very bright and agile. So what you're going to be doing five to ten years from now is should be completely unpredictable, right? You know, it should be uh, you shouldn't be doing the same old thing. So if you come across as knowing the field, knowing what's exciting, what's, you know, have some historic sense of the field and where it's going and where you want to be, that's really important. And again, all that should be sort of woven into your narrative. Or to, to make a, to get, to loop this back to some of the earlier questions, right, there's a, if, there's, if the field is very tight and your PI is the person in that field and that he or she has the grant that ever comes from out of an SF or an IH for that, and you say, well, I'm going to be doing the same thing, you're setting yourself for failure right? because you're going to be competing directly for that source of money. And that, that happens, right? It's not necessarily the case for any of you here, but we've had candidates like this come through. So in that case, you really need to take a bigger jump. You say, well, I've captured all those skills and I've learned from the best and actually the only scientist in the field and I'm going to do something else. Uh, and I find a way to rearrange myself. But that depends on, on the specifics of, of what you're, you're working in and, and of the, the, the general structure of the funding in your field. What if you have a spouse or significant other on the market? We've heard some people say, oh, you should mention that right away in the cover letter. And other people say, no, I'll even bring it up until you're negotiating. Here. It depends a lot on the climate of the place you're applying to, which you don't necessarily know. So I've been a department chair. As a department chair, it takes a long time to negotiate the second faculty position for the spouse. Right? So if you're trying to make this happen, the more lead time that person has to try and pull all the strings together and do all the behind the scenes politics, the better. So if you're working with a group who are going to be really 
supportive and really want to hire you, the more time you give them, the more likely it is that everything will come together and fall into place. At the same time, if you're working with a group that maybe isn't that enthusiastic about you or just isn't that worried about two-body problems, then they may see that and say, I was just not bothered with doing all that work. And let's move on to a candidate who will just be easier. And you don't necessarily know going into it who you're dealing with. You can sometimes talk to your advisor and get some advice on different places. They might have insight into individuals at different places. You may have different strategies for different schools. I guess I would probably not bring it up until you're at least in the interview or short list kind of thing. And um, I guess the other thing is if the position is in the same field as your spouse, make sure that your spouse applies for the same position also. Just because even if you end up being the one with the interview, if you, particularly if you're at a state school where the, um, you know, the sort of legal uh, parameters of the search and everything are very strictly defined, it may be logistically very difficult for that department to hire your spouse unless your spouse was already um, on the inter on the applicant list. I know that happened to us a fair amount at University of Oregon um, when we were hiring, and so um, and there were spousal um, issues. So yeah. So even if it's a stretch for the, your the spouse to be in that search. Yeah. So from uh, my job search, um, it basically always came up uh, in preparing for the second visit. They would always ask. Um, Actually, during the first visit, if it seemed to be going well, they would usually ask, yeah, so is your wife also in science or whatever? And which they can't ask. It which they speak. cannot <laughs> ask. It's, it's against the law. So, but in any case, that it works, we're happy. <laughs> <laughs> and we would then um, set up interviews for my wife on the return visit. So my wife's a physician, and you know these are all medical schools, so it would set up interviews for her to talk to people like that. And um, it worked really pretty smoothly that way. But Patrick and I were talking about this before, but I, I, you know, it doesn't always work that smoothly, so maybe you could speak to that. <laughs> Not really. But, uh, <laughs> but the, uh, I mean, the, the point is, I mean, this is mainly a, a board about yeah, the right. application. The application is just to work. I think that's the main message. Uh, if, if, it, if it comes up, you need to give the head away, but there's no point in giving head away at this point because if they're not even going to start thinking about it before they shake your hand. So if there's interviews in December or January, that's about the best you can do. And you may or may not hope for something to happen within six months. It may take a year, it may take a year and a half. There may be all sorts of other options that are explored. But mentioning it in September or October, the application will not make any difference in that, in that respect. And in my situation is that we were looking for jobs seven year apart, so it's a different uh, dynamics altogether. Mm -hmm. I didn't bring it up when that was on the market. Kind of along those lines, I was sort of wondering timeline, what the average time, you know, to maybe applying to finding out about a position, to, if you find out, out, of a, out about a position, how long you would have to accept it if it was offered to you? It depends. Most assistant professor positions get advertised kind of August, September-ish. November, January-ish. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, in engineering, it, there's positions that appear in, up to yeah. January. Yeah, you will see, like, you will see, like, the big bolus kind of early fall. But, yeah, there will be spread on it. Um, most interviewing happens between, like, December and March. Most offers get made between January and April. Um, they will usually tell you that they want an answer back in like two weeks or something. Or yesterday, if they could. Right. Um, <laughs> and usually you can push back on that because usually you still have interviews to go and, and things. So candidates pretty much never answer in two weeks. They usually say, well, I have to complete all of my interviews that are already scheduled and things like that. And the schools generally go ahead and give in to that and wait. So, but usually everyone's kind of accepted for assistant professor jobs. have accepted in that cycle by 
in mid-age and kind of timeline somewhere in there, and usually start then like August. So I say it depends because it depends in, in a way that's meaningful and important. Right? Each field has a characteristic deadline. And I'm, so I'm part of chemistry and physics department. Most chemistry departments have deadline for applications that are late September, early October. And that's it. Right? There's no chemistry job that will appear in November or December. In physics, the job deadlines are typically November 1st or November 15th or December 1st or December 15th. And it spreads over the regime. And if you're in engineering, they can, depending on which subfield of engineering, they can be earlier or later. In chemical engineering, for instance, there's a, a big conference in mid-November called AKI, and all the job candidates are expected to go there and present the poster and schmooze with the different departments. So each subfield has a very different culture for recruitment and the timeline that's associated with it. Chemistry at, at Duke and more and more around the country is trying to make sure that they're done with all their interviews before Christmas and make their offers between Christmas and New Year. Right? Or early January at the latest. That's, that's the new thing. That's how it's evolving. And which means that the second visits take place in January and everything is compressed. It's seen as a way to be competitive or it's perceived as being worth. And, and the important thing for you to know is how it is in your field. Right? You, you, you can look at what the ads are when they appear and what deadlines there are and ask around. But they can be, they can, they vary overall through academia. The only constant is everything is finished before the deans go on summer vacation. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, it's extremely variable. So there is generally kind of an academic year cycle. Yeah. yeah. Uh, perhaps my question is more specific towards Patrick because I'm also Canadian. So my question is, um, how much weight does the nationality of the candidate, you know, weigh? Because if you imagine U.S. citizens versus permanent residents versus internationals, we don't look at it at all. I do. We don't. Uh, I, I can't speak for other places. And there could be some presidential candidates who are going to put up a wall between the U.S. <laughs> and the <laughs> Yeah, we can scale that wall. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really not. Uh, I mean, it's not so much where you were born, but really uh, where and how you got your credentials. And there again, it's not the country, but you know, if you work in a whole prize winning lab in, in Germany, you know, no one cares. So related question, does that affect your eligibility for applying for the grants? Mm, uh, typically not, but there are some exceptions. There's some junior faculty awards from the Army that are not available for non green card holders. Uh, but then there's a few foundations that have specific rules. But NSF and IH, uh, the, the main funding sources, the one, I mean the ones that would typically make your research sustainable are not dependent on this. So it's not such a big deal, but there's some of the nice perks, you know, nice compliment that could buffer difficult times that are not. But it's a, I would say it's less than 20% than of them. So I want to return to the references. So <clears throat> two, typically you have three, right? Two of them come from your advisor, your PhD and your postdoc advisor. And so the third one, What's the best way to choose it? Does name recognition matter a lot? Um, do you choose to highlight somebody who knows your teaching, or do you go with your collaborators? What is what is your your take on that? I think it will end up being different for every different individual. Um, it may be that <coughs> the person who knows you best will be someone you TA for, and is going to talk mainly about your teaching. Um, it may be that you've had a collaboration that's been deep enough that someone can really talk about you, and that's a great letter. Um, you don't want a letter that says, I had this person in my class and they got an A. <laughs> you really don't want that letter. So you, know, you want a letter from someone who really knows you as a person. Yeah, I think this goes back to the personal narrative. Uh, you know, if you are applying to a, a small liberal arts college that has the main emphasis on teaching, sure, you would want to go for the person who could speak best to your teaching ability. 
and, and then you know have your other two. But otherwise, I think it's whatever you want to reinforce in your statement, use that letter writer to do that. Choose the letter writer so that they will be the best person to sort of hammer that home. Certainly, uh, name recognition counts a fair amount, I would say, especially to the people who are more outside of the field. If they've heard of this famous person, this famous person is saying great things about you, that helps. But if you get the famous person and their letter is bland, bland got a name. and they barely know you, <laughs> yeah. then it doesn't help you. Yeah, it hurts you probably. Yeah. yeah, because it shows lack of judgment. So, you know, you really have to think carefully about how well they know you and what they're going to say. Yeah, so I think if, if you want to drive in your narrative that you've really differentiated yourself from your um, postdoctoral advisor, and you have collaborators who can attest to, yeah, this was the person who's driving this forward. It's amazing that this came out of this lab, which usually doesn't isn't in this field and stuff like that. I think that could really, you know, yeah. And I think how much does knowing people at that particular university help? Method at the conference, or you know, is there any way you can network, or is that completely not happen? It helps a little bit in that you know, that person is probably more likely to kind of pull your file out and look at it. Um, so if your file is amazing, it's great. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's not kind of a huge make or break. Yeah. Um, it might help cut through the noise we were talking about earlier, where you know it would, you know, alert some member of the search committee that already met you to recognize your name, pull it out, and say, "Oh, yeah, well, what well, we should consider this person or something." It might help at that level, but ultimately, it's not going to have much of that. Hopefully, I think for yeah for our search, we had somewhere um, the chair knew that person's advisor and things like that happened where. You know, it can put you in sort of the finalist pool, but it still really doesn't matter in terms of the ultimate decision. Yeah, in my field, like was mentioned for this other conference, Aki, there is this fall conference where all kind of the faculty candidates are there, and all the search committees. They actually have a session called Meet the Future, Meet the Faculty Candidates, or Meet the Future Faculty, something like that. And the search committees are going through these posters, and, and it's kind of a pre-screening. Um, so kind of the networking there does matter to some degree. Um, and people are kind of keeping notes and kind of going to be looking out for their files there. Um, so. Um, can you comment on the search committee's perspective on hiring someone straight out of a PhD versus a postdoc, and if there's any benefit to applying straight out of a PhD? So historically in engineering, it used to be common, but um, at this point, I haven't seen someone hired straight out of a PhD in a long time. It depends on the funding in your field. Right? And these days, there's no funding in any field that exceeds the, the need by much. But if there's, and so it used to be that if you're a computer scientist and it was so hard to do retention compared to uh, the industry that, uh, and, and there was so much money poured at the field that departments wanted to hire computer scientists and therefore they went for the PhD candidates. Uh, I'm not sure it's true today. Uh, I mean, I've not talked to computer scientists recently, but there's sort of some subfields that were just very highly in demand both in the industry and from the federal funding strand. But the, the last Great Recession has caught a lot of that problem away. Yeah, I mean, you know, think of it from the department's or the university's standpoint. They're investing a lot in the search, obviously a lot of time and everything to do the search, but then once they make an offer, they're investing a ton of money for startup, salary, <coughs> everything, and it basically locks up that position you know, until you come up for tenure, and they're going to want you to be successful in going through tenure. So why would they hire someone who was a risk unless there were really, really good reasons for hiring that person at, you know, a very junior stage? If there are lots of people who are at least as good as you in the postdoc stage, they are more seasoned, they're more, you know, likely to succeed long term. It's a bit more of a risk with a, 
um, person straight out of grad school. I mean, that being said, one way in which a school can aspire to raise itself above the others by taking risk and winning. Yeah. And so you hire kind of the, you know, a year before everyone else. But I think, you know, and Duke likes to think of itself as, as a place like this, right? And it's one of the, the motto in the search committees, like we're, 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 we're looking, we, we can't have, we don't have the name recognition that other schools have, but we're, we're smarter at evaluating the landscape. But I think that even under that context, we wouldn't hire people straight out of PhDs. Should you mention in your research statement if you want to collaborate with anyone in the department? Like, should you say, like, oh, I'd love to collaborate with Dr. Coe and Dr. West? Or should you only do that if you have their permission? Would you be stepping on people's toes if you did that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I put stuff like that in the cover letter, actually. Um, and in terms of evaluating people's things, it's, uh, you know, it's, it is good to hear that, yeah, they've actually gone through and seen who their future colleagues would be, um, and that they've actually thought about it to an extent that they can actually see, oh, yeah, I could possibly interact with those people correctly. But, but it's a risk, because if you get it wrong, you pass for a fool. Yeah. If you mention someone who's just shutting down their lab, for instance, <laughs> which you didn't know, because it's not public and the website doesn't show, right? But you, you Google around, you're like, you know, people will laugh at your file rather than say they think it's insightful. Or if you say you want to collaborate with someone who's well known to be uh, someone that everyone hates and doesn't collaborate with. <laughs> it's also, so if you understand the landscape well enough to make this call in an enlightened way, sure. If you don't know, you're just fishing in the dark, uh, yeah. stay on the safe side. Because John's not going to read the letter anyway. So. Yeah, no, <laughs> but uh, um, the other thing is that that's probably something better suited for the interview process. And you can do it without saying it directly. You can just, when you meet with that person, just say, you know, I've always been inspired by this, you know, stuff that your lab's been doing. And then you get into a really, you know, heady conversation about the science and they get excited and you know that's where you're, you're sort of setting the groundwork for collaboration without ever mentioning it and then that person is if they're in the search committee or in their departmental discussion they'll say you know this person would be great here I could really see collaborating with them and you didn't say a word about collaborating you just you know connected on the science level or the personal level or whatever Okay, I believe that we have reached the end of our time, so let's thank our panelists.